Hi, Adrian Hartley here, novelist, Shakespeare professor, traveler, I guess. <laughs> um, about a year ago, I did a series on traveling in Japan, which people seem to respond to. And I, lately, I've had a lot of questions from people, particularly from Americans, about traveling to the UK. Obviously, I'm from the UK originally, but I haven't lived there for whatever, 35 years more. Uh, but I, I go back a lot uh, by myself, with my family, or with students in the past many, many times. So I'm, I'm comfortable traveling around the UK. I just got back, and I thought I would do something to recap our trip for anybody who cares, but also as a kind of how-to something a bit like the, the videos that I did on traveling to Japan. And part of the reason I think people might find this interesting and useful is that we were in the north for two weeks. And a lot of people, when they come, when they travel to the UK, particularly for the first time, they focus on London and places that they can get to from London, like Canterbury or Stonehenge or whatever. Um, or they also go to Scotland, to Edinburgh. And both of those areas are quite heavily congested with tourists. And I think that there's so much to the UK that travelers often don't see. So I thought I would do something on traveling in the north and walk you through what we did and why, how you might do something comparable if you wanted to, see some of the things that we saw. Most of these were places that I already knew, though many of them I hadn't been to for decades. And a couple were, were new. So, let's start. So we flew into Manchester. That's, for us, we're based in Charlotte. Uh, and that's a little less easy than it used to be, thanks American, uh, because we can't fly direct. So I had we had to fly from... Uh, Charlotte to Atlanta on Delta and then Delta's partner Virgin from Atlanta to Manchester. Depending on where you are, you may be able to fly direct. Manchester's a good, busy, large airport in terms of access to the north. The alternative is that you could fly to London and then take an internal flight. We found that in order to do so, we would then have quite a long layover in Heathrow or Gatwick in, in London, which you don't really want to do after you've just done an eight-hour transatlantic flight and then sit around in an airport waiting for your connection. So we didn't want to do that. You know, in the past, many times I have taken the train, which is comparative was comparatively easy from either of those major airports to get on a train and go straight up north. And it's only, what, three hours, maybe less, to get to Manchester or that area. I'm from Preston originally, so many of my trips have been, you know, focused on the northwest. This time we're doing sort of the northeast and the northwest. But, you know, trains have not been great over the last year or so in the UK. A lot of delays, a lot of cancellations, a lot of strikes, you know, all the things that we were promised wouldn't happen after the railways were uh, sold off to private enterprise. So thanks, Tories. So rather than risk delays on the train, we took the option of flying to Atlanta and then on to Manchester, whereupon I rented a car. But Manchester's a great base if you want to see the north. And, you know, as I say, a lot of people, the first time they visit the UK, they focus on London and that area, which is totally understandable. But I think, as I hope this video will make clear, the north offers a lot which is very different from the south. And Manchester's a great starting point to get into the north. The alternative is that you could fly into Edinburgh in Scotland and then come south. That's also a possibility. So driving in England. <laughs> For Americans, driving in the UK is quite daunting, understandably, and it presents certain challenges which are quite different from driving for the most part in the US. Obviously, you're driving on the right-hand side, and that's going to change which hands you use for, you know, 
uh, gear shifts and lights and things like that. When you book a rental car, make sure you specify automatic. There's still a lot of cars, if you want an automatic, a lot of cars in the UK are still manual. People prefer it. Though I think automatic is getting more common. And I would be cautious about getting a big car. If you're intending to do what we did and get kind of off the beaten track and into the more out of the way places, the roads get very small. And the last thing you want to be doing is spending your entire trip worrying about nicking or scratching or bashing the rental car. Likewise, make sure you have decent insurance. Unfortunately, this is likely to bump your price up when you rent your car. But your US insurance almost certainly will not cover you. So I would get the um, extra insurance offered by the rental company. This is obviously quite expensive. I mean, to the point of extortion. But as I say, the roads are narrow and you don't want to be worrying about getting a, a bill for thousands of dollars for a couple of little dings. And, and you know, the, the rental companies will go out of their way to tell you that that's what will happen if you, you know, bash the car. I would just sort of suck that up and assume that it's going to be expensive. Likewise, I would assume that gas is going to be expensive. It's something like, I don't know, three, maybe four times the price of gas in the U.S. Now, that said, the distances that you're going to be covering, for the most part, are not that great. Then It's not like driving coast to coast in the U.S. It's not remotely that size. So I found that, you know, we did a pretty extensive trip, as you'll see, and we did it on a little over one full tank of gas. So, you know, I don't think that I wouldn't worry unduly about that. As far as driving is concerned, where we are, where we were going, the access to motorways to the equivalent of an American freeway is comparatively limited and many cities are not connected by freeways. So you're on A roads or B roads rather than motorways. Even the motorways are narrow, the lanes are narrower and there's not as many of them. You don't get those sort of huge sprawling six lane um, freeways that you get here. So you have to be really attentive. But motorway driving is comparatively easy. I would say that English drivers are better than American. I just think that is the case. Um, partly because they have to be. They've got to be more in control of their vehicles because um, the uh, because as I say the roads are tighter. They also the, the driving test process is more exacting, and the police response is less tolerant. So yeah, um, people generally do the speed limit, and they are much more courteous, which is essential on these very very narrow roads, which I'll say more about later on. But yeah, I, I would say. Um, yeah, the motorway driving is comparatively easy. The the coming off the slip roads, the the where you merge onto the motorway, you don't have a lot of space, a lot of time, so you have to be very attentive and get on and get up to speed fairly quickly. There are delays on the motorways, sometimes more than you're used to in the US. Um I would avoid traveling at rush hour, particularly around major cities. Another thing I would say. The car that we had had a sat nav in it, but the um, rental car company didn't seem to be able to guarantee that in advance. It was something of a crapshoot when we showed up. Ours happened to have a sat nav in the car, but it was a little out of date. So some of the places that we were going to just didn't really register. So at some point, I think there is a decent chance that you're going to have to switch over to some kind of contemporary phone-based app, a map, a Google Maps or a, a Apple, you know, equivalent. And I would say also, I mean, there were three of us, my wife and my son in the back. And there were certainly times when I felt like I'm not sure how comfortable I would be doing this by myself because I had to focus so much on the road, <laughs> on not hitting things, <laughs> that I left the navigation 
entirely to my wife and my son periodically, you know. So they were sort of following things either on the sat nav or on their phones, which means, of course, that you're going to need some sort of uh, data plan for your phone system. The alternative is that you pick up a SIM card for your phone in the airport, a British SIM card, and you switch over to that for the duration of your trip. And you pay whatever it costs. But you're going to need something. And we were relying on Wi-Fi, which was not always convenient. And there are certain areas where parking requires you to use a specific parking app. And there are even some places where those parking apps simply would not work on a non-UK phone, um, which is a pain. Anyway, you need some sort of data plan for your phone so that you can navigate by it. The other thing I would say about driving is there are, the roundabouts are everywhere and they vary in size from something so small you could drive right across it without even seeing it to these huge sprawling roundabouts with traffic lights and multiple entrances and you know six or seven exit points. The UK, UK drivers are used to roundabouts in ways that Americans are not. And you need to be constantly watching which lane you're in. So you need to know exactly which exit you're going off before you reach the roundabout so you know where your road positioning should be. It sounds, it's not complicated, but it just requires constant vigilance. That said, most of the driving is not going to be on the motorway, especially if you go the way that we did. What we did, as I said, we flew into Manchester. I, we immediately rented the car, picked up the car, which means that for me, I had to get some sleep on the plane just so that I was alert enough to then drive. And that's not an easy thing for me. I, ne I never sleep particularly well on planes, but I got a couple of hours and I felt okay. So, so we arrived in Manchester and went straight to York. York's a, a nice base to, to start with. It's a beautiful medieval city its roots are viking i mean they're earlier than that but a lot of the the core settlement is is viking and it features a great viking museum called jorvik it's a little theme parky for my tastes but it's a, a sort of family favorite from for people with younger kids we didn't do it on this trip i've done it before and there's some great viking artifacts there but it's a, yeah, it's a bit theme parky for me and quite expensive. There's so much to do in York. One of the, the things that I really love about York is the, the walls, the medieval city walls, much of which you can walk on for large sections of the city and get a sense of what it felt like. The walls have been sort of redone at various points in, in history and turned into a kind of walkway in the sort of late 18th and uh, early 19th century. One of the differences between England and the US is that in England some of the cities have walls but the bigger difference is that in the US the lawyers would never allow this because it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. There's also Clifford's Tower, one of the castle keeps that dominated the city. People always ask what I miss about England. And it's stuff like this in York where just everywhere you look there's history a thousand years of it. And you have architecture and such. Don't get that in Charlotte. One of the things that we discovered early on was that a lot of the places that we were most interested in were run by an organization called English Heritage. 
many of the sort of publicly owned historical landmarks in the UK are controlled by either by English Heritage or by the National Trust. National Trust tend to have the big fancy country houses, the stately homes, and the English Heritage tend to have the sort of more outdoorsy ruin type things, which, to be honest, I prefer and my family prefers. And they're sort of grand and rugged and romantic and evocative rather than the kind of museum-y internal structures that are like the sort of stately homes and things. So we started to plan our trip around English heritage sites and we were able to buy comparatively cheaply a pass for two weeks, a family pass for two weeks, which made all of those, I can't remember what we paid for it, I will check. It was $150 or thereabouts. That's for two plus one adult because my son is older. The family pass is an even better deal. These are, that was about $100. So these are the overseas visitor passes. Good deal. And that covered us for two weeks and basically gave us free admission to all the different sites that we were going to go to. And we built our trip around associated English heritage spots. We're at Kirkham Priory in Yorkshire. And there are bulls. Stay on this side of the wall. Kirkham Priory's 12th century. Obviously it was uh, demolished in the 1530s or so by Henry VIII he claimed all the land and what have you. This area was actually used for training during the Second World War. They used this area between the wall here and the river to prepare for D-Day. They flooded it and used it to prepare um, landing craft and things like that. You're amazing. I really recommend that. I think that they do a terrific job of maintaining these sort of older ruiny kind of uh, sites. They have fantastic guidebooks and some of the places have really good information displays and attached museums and things which are all part of the part of the deal. So from York, we spent a, a, just a couple of nights in York. Mallard has the land speed record for steam engines. 126 miles an hour. I was obsessed with it when I was a kid and I just finally got my own HO scale model for my layout. Isn't it pretty? And then the plan was to head up the Yorkshire coast you could, if you wanted, of course, spend more time in the sort of inland, uh, the North Yorkshire moors. But we wanted to go to the coast and we picked spots which we could comfortably get to, you know, in just an hour or two's driving. And then we would spend two nights in that spot and do things in that area. I'm at the abandoned medieval village of Warren Percy in Yorkshire. We're at Scarborough Castle. Yorkshire. So we're at Whitby Abbey. So what we did was we head up to Flamborough and then up through Whitby and Scarborough all the way up to Durham, which is, means crossing into Northumberland. And then from Durham up further north, right up to the Scottish border around Berwick-upon-Tweed. And we it's specifically so that we could go out to Lindisfarne, Holy Island, and then we came back, taking a more diagonal course down towards Hexham, and then basically ran west along Hadrian's Wall into the North Lakes, the lakes being the Lake District of, of Cumbria. Spent time in, in Holtwhistle and moving then through Penrith and down to uh, Ullswater. And we met up with my mother, and then we spent a few days there in the Ullswater area and then dropped her off in Preston and then we went back to Manchester and flew out the following day. And in order to make it easier, we always book an airport hotel in Manchester 
so that we can deal with dropping off the car. So we're not, we're not stressed about traffic on the day that we're flying out because, you know, most flights are usually sort of late morning lunchtime. But you want to be there in plenty of time and the traffic around Manchester can get very, very heavy on a, on a weekday. So we always book into an airport hotel. I stay at the Radisson Blue because then you can literally walk from the hotel to your gate without any difficulty. So what's the advantage of a trip like this? Well, apart from getting away from all the usual tourist crowds, you get to see stuff like this. So we're at Bempton Cliffs RSPV Reserve on the Yorkshire coast. And these are gannets. So cool. There's a thousand year old chapel here that was itself built on the remains of a Roman signal tower. It's all part of Scarborough Castle, which was built in the 12th century mostly. Amazing stuff. So we're at Whitby Abbey, which apart from being interesting as a medieval ruin, is also associated with Dracula but we couldn't come at night so we're here in the day which keeps the vampires away. It's the churchyard where Lucy Westenra was bitten by Dracula as witnessed by Mina Harker in this churchyard. And Whitby Abbey behind me which would have been a lot scarier in the 19th century because there was no ice cream van. Yeah. I was a student here. Oh, there you go. going up the Cathedral Tower in Durham. Halfway up, it's a long way. Show the stairs. All right, let's go. Oh. Hi. Okay. We made it. It's too high. <laughs> it's too high. We're going down. <laughs> this does not feel safe. I think we should go. Carry 
Harry Potter got very old. I love castles. If you've read any of my fantasy adventures, the Act of Will stories, for example, you'll know that I love castles. And trips like this are effectively research. This is uh, the castle of the, the Percys in Northumberland, which was at least partly destroyed. This area was partly destroyed during combat with King Henry IV, whose cannons destroyed this wall out here. <laughs> it's pretty cool. This is the stuff I miss. Yeah, I love this. Look at this. See that fireplace up there on that extra floor? Can you see where the floor supports were? I'm a castle nerd. Big surprise. This is on the second floor. These are the, the kitchens, including the big fireplaces where they'd roast meat. We serve the Great Hall. It's pretty impressive. Amazing. Surprisingly well intact for a 14th century building. This here would be the the buttery, larder and storage. And then this is the great hall itself. Again. Big fireplace. The minstrels gallery where they play music. Right up at the top is the tower. The surviving Percy, after uh, the Battle of Shrewsbury, when the, the Percy's, you know, known in Shakespeare as Hotspur was killed, under Henry V, the surviving members of the Percy family were uh, made peace with the king and were able to get the castle back and their Earl of Northumbria, Northumberland status as well. The rich always come out on top somehow, don't they? A little ways off the Northumberland coast, only a few miles south of the Scottish border, is the island of Lindisfarne, or Holy Island, which was central to the birth of Christianity in Britain. Had a number of different monasteries built on it at different periods and is connected to the mainland by a narrow causeway which is submerged during high tide. So you have to be careful on your timing. On Lindisfarne, the abbey was built in the 7th century, the original. It's been rebuilt many times and like everything else on this trip, mostly destroyed in about 1537 on the dissolution of the monastery. So behind me you can see the rainbow arch, which is pretty cool. Walked about seven miles so far today on Lindisfarne. It's the castle behind me. Fantastic weather, beautiful day. I mean, who knew that monkeys could do this? Monks! Monks? Monks? Not monkeys. It's not that good then, really, is it? It's amazing to, to think that monkeys were able to build these kind of constructions. It's amazing to think that monkeys were able to build these kind of so we moved from seeing a lot of ancient medieval remains, early medieval and high medieval remains, and then went into the sort of the, the ancient Roman, sort of roughly first century, and uh, thereafter uh, remains of Hadrian's Wall. I'm at Chester's Roman cavalry fort on uh, Hadrian's Wall. Which is very cool. 
Not least of which because one of the things I just learned is that in this gatehouse here, on one of the sort of the def best defensive positions on, on the fort, they had a bread oven. Nice to think that the soldiers could get for a nice fresh bread while they were guarding. Hadrian's Wall, walking along the ridge here. Scotland is that way. England is this way. It is possible to walk the entire length of Hadrian's Wall, but it's 73 miles, so that's something that would take a fair amount of planning. There's not that much of the wall, and frequently it disappears entirely, so that in, in the best places, what you have mostly is only four or five feet high, um, of course, the, the land has changed. It used to be higher than that. And in certain areas, the wall is built on a very, very steep ridge. So even though the wall itself is not that high, there's a huge drop off to the side. There are parts which are uh, walkable around uh, Housteads, Roman Fort, uh, where it's actually a little treacherous. You've got to be careful. I would be wary of taking young children if they were not being closely supervised. But the walk itself is absolutely spectacular, especially if you have decent weather, as we did. As you can probably tell, it's extremely windy, but it was clear and fine and, um, uh, and, and, and quite sunny. And we were able to walk about three or four miles in one direction to a local agricultural fair and check that out and then back to Housestead. So it was probably about, I don't know, seven or eight miles round trip. Absolutely worth doing. Beautiful. So Lanacost Priory, which is surprisingly extensive and impressive. Apparently up there, there are kestrels nesting. see how extensive it is. Ullswater, which is in the sort of the more remote region of the North Lakes. All of these places are comparatively tourist free. You'll see a few, but the, the places are not overwhelmed. One of the reasons that you will see a lot fewer tourists in the North Lakes than in the more populous areas around Windermere and Grasmere and um, and Kendall is that they are a lot less accessible. And when you come from, particularly when you come from the north, those roads are very, very narrow and, and windy and difficult. And you simply can't get the big tour buses and things up there. So when people go to the Lake District, particularly when they're coming from the south, they tend to only reach Windermere and Ambleside and that kind of area. And so they'll see that, but it tends, especially in the summer months, it is overrun. 
So that was basically the itinerary. This is one of my favorite places in the Lake District, Castle Rig Stone Circle. About 4,500 years old. Neolithic, I guess. And behind me is Helvellyn, one of the peaks of the Lake District. Pretty cool spot. It's best when you come first thing in the morning when there aren't so many people around, but still pretty cool. From Keswick, you can walk up Latrig, which is a pretty easy hike, do it in, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. This gives you great views out over the town. You can see Castle Rig Stone Circle in the distance. And then Bassenthwaite and Derwent Water are the lakes beyond the town. Beautiful countryside. We stayed in a variety of places. In York, we stayed in a hotel just outside Micklegate. That was the only true hotel that we stayed in on the entire trip. As I said, we only spent two nights there. The rest, we stayed in either rental cottages or pubs, all of which we booked on like Travelocity or Booking.com. And we had no, no issues, no problems. One of the pubs that we stayed in was not quite ideal because... The pub itself turned out to be closed. One of the reasons we had chosen it was because we thought, great, you can go there, park, hang out, and there'll be food and drink right there. We won't have to go anywhere. But the pub was actually being refurbished. So it was a bit like being in a haunted house because the rooms were, were, were fine, but, were, but there's basically nobody there. And the pub itself underneath was, was completely shut. So anyway, yeah, so we, we stayed in a number of, uh, of, of nice, easy rental places. And this is another way of seeing a different side of the country. You know, some of the places that we stayed in were farmhouses that were parts of active working farms. And some of them were, as I say, pubs. And some of them were, were quite old. You know, we stayed in a, one of the places we stayed in was built in 1721 I think so you know you're, you're in a completely different kind of uh, space and that's part of the fun of, of going and, and seeing these other sorts of places as opposed to being in a generic western style you know a Radisson or, or whatever uh, a Premier Inn or any of those kind of places which is fine for transit but not interesting of themselves when you're in the middle of nowhere, it's nice if the place itself that you're in is somewhat interesting. The UK as a whole is quite expensive if you live there on a UK wage. But because the pound is quite weak against the dollar at the moment, it's actually not that expensive for foreign travelers, from the US at least. We still, I, I still used some cash when I was there, pounds. But a lot of places were cash free and so you pay on credit card. Most of them expect you to do the sort of tap and go kind of credit cards. Obviously, you know, you, your US credit cards should work, but you should notify your bank or your credit card issuer before you go so that you have no issues with that. You don't generally tip in the UK. So the price that you get is the price that you pay. If you want to add a little extra, you can, but in many places, they are so unused to that that there doesn't seem to be a provision for it in most credit card payments. There's no option to add a tip. So it's useful to have some cash just to leave on the table if you want. And that will endear you to the locals because most people don't do it. As ever, you know, with these kind of trips, the biggest expense is the flight. In many of these places, we met or saw very few foreign tourists. We met some Americans on Hadrian's Wall. And of course, in places like York, there are more. But in many of them, there's almost nobody. You know, this is part, And this is part of the appeal for, for me, that it feels like you're sort of escaping the masses and the... Um, 
the sort of cookie cutter, you know, guidebook tour. This is obviously a certain kind of trip. This is not a trip where you go for nightlife and, uh, and that kind of entertainment. This is not that at all. This is about peace and remoteness. It's so hard in the UK to find wild places, right? Quite unlike the US, where huge parts of the country feel you know, completely uninhabited and basically haven't changed that much for thousands of years. That's rare in Europe because it's so densely populated and because it has been densely populated for so long, for centuries and centuries and centuries. The southern parts of the UK are, are you know, beautiful in the countryside, you know, but it's quainter. It's more clearly farmed. In the north, it's wilder and bleaker if you if you've seen shows like tv shows like vera or shetland you know that kind of landscape i love that i love that where the farmland is basically moorland with sheep um and you know you'll see cattle pastures and things like that but a lot of the a lot of the 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 landscape is it is wide open, and especially in, in a lot of the, the north, mostly treeless because of the wind. We got lucky with the weather in, in several ways. One, in that it didn't rain all the time. You know, it's a sort of standing joke that particularly in the Lake District, in the northwest, it's probably the wettest part of a, a very wet country. Um, but we actually didn't get very much rain at all, and what we got tended to be fairly light there was we had a a couple of of heavy downpours when we were in durham but for the most part we got lucky now i say lucky but you know the temperatures were in the 50s and 60s maybe even dropping into the 40s at night so you should dress appropriately and in layers that you can shed if it warms up which is unlikely to do but for us coming from charlotte where it's 90 degrees for six months you know this was fantastic people in the uk are constantly apologizing for the weather but for us it's great to be able to be to enjoy being outside you know and as you see from the video a lot of the time though the weather was fantastic it wasn't warm and there's a lot of wind um and a lot of cloud and a lot of sort of microclimate shifts you know um constantly changing but it's, I, I love it. It's one of the things I miss most. Yeah. As far as food is concerned, obviously, when you leave behind the big cities, especially the cities that are, you know, very cosmopolitan and used to a lot of tourists or people from lots of different backgrounds, food options get a little bit reduced. The most restaurant um, possibilities that we saw were in York and in Durham. Most of the other places that we were staying, we ate either at pubs, which gets a little limited because you, as you notice when you spend, when you go from pub to pub, the menus don't change that much. And much as I love them, there are only so many steak and ale pies I can eat. Pork pie, can't get pork pies in America. Mm. Yum. Some of the more uh, adventurous pubs will offer other kinds of things which have become almost staples like chicken tikka masala and things like that, which I'm, you know, okay. If you're prepared to have that kind of food, I would recommend going to Indian restaurants. We ate probably as much at Indian restaurants as we did anywhere else because in Indian food in the UK is really good and some of the Indian food in the North is spectacular. Um, we had, uh, uh, I'll, I'll make a couple of recommendations, you know, on the last night, we didn't want to deal with driving into Manchester, which has unbelievable Indian food in rush home, but I didn't, we didn't feel like navigating the traffic. So we went to Stockport and went to a place called from Bombay to Mumbai, which was terrific, really, really good and interesting. So yeah, a lot of great Indian food. Also, we had a really good Chinese meal in Durham. Most of the rest of the food that we had was fairly sort of conventional English pub food, uh, which, you know, 
is fine. And there's a, quite a lot of Italian, uh, including a lot of pizza, especially in, in towns that have university populations and things, which, you know, s- solid rather than remarkable, but, you know, decent. I think English food gets a bad rap internationally, but that's because people associate it with post-war Britain, which was still recovering from rationing and shortages of other kinds, um, and no, was not very good. But there are more options now. Certainly in, in, in big cities, there are lots of, of good food options. As far as the indigenous stuff is concerned, I would say, you know, I, pies, a lot of bakeries, both chains and individuals, so great bread. But yeah, a lot of pies and pastries. Cheese, English cheese, is so much better than American cheese that I can't even begin to describe it. So yeah, get some decent cheese inside you while you're there. Um, And sweets, desserts, a lot of great English stuff. And, you know, the chocolate is really good, especially in a place like York, which has a long history of chocolate manufacture. For the most part, English chocolate is better than American chocolate. That's just how it is. Sorry. And if in doubt, there's always fish and chips. And that's it. I hope you found that interesting or entertaining or useful or at least opening some possibilities that maybe you hadn't thought about as far as travel was concerned and as ever please like comment subscribe check out my books check out my patreon page thank you to my patrons who make this channel possible check out my merchandise and i will talk to you soon thanks bye